Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm Chief Knowledge Broker for Octo, um, which is Open Communications for the Ocean. We're very pleased to have today on our webinar series, Prairie Canals with the Ocean Governance Project. Uh, she's gonna be speaking today about ocean governance um, for MPA managers in exchanging experiences between Southeast Asia and the Atlantic. Um, and before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know how the webinar will run. So Puri will be presenting to us and then we will allow time for questions um, from, the, from all the participants at the end after the main presentation. If you had any quick clarifying questions, like what uh, an acronym stands for, we could go ahead and ask Puri those during the presentation, but otherwise we'll hold all the substantial questions till the end. Um, we highly encourage you to send in your questions throughout the webinar, though. We can uh, keep them for the end. You can send in questions either through the question panel um, by typing them in there or through the chat interface, and um, you can share them with just the posts and panelists or with all attendees. Um, and the, the chat functionality is open for sharing thoughts on the webinar too on the presentation. Uh, we just ask that you be respectful and keep it to the topic, but you're welcome to exchange ideas and comments and thoughts with the, the, with the presenters and panelists and um, other attendees in the chat. Okay, Pori, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you very much, Sarah. So it's a pleasure to, to be finally with this webinar. We have been finding the right day, but finally I think we, we found it. So welcome everyone, and thanks for your interest in, in listening at, at us. So I, I hope that what I'm going to present is will be um, responding to your expectations. So that the, um, the presentation today is about uh, a project, a European Union project, which is called Ocean Governance, Protecting and Restoring Marine Ecosystems, Catalysts for Building Peace and Security, and Fostering Sustainable Economies. So is in the project is implemented in Southeast Asia and the Atlantic Ocean Basin. So uh, the, the, the project, the overall objective is to increase the European Union role as a global actor in international ocean governance by fostering this regional and international cooperation relevant for the protection and restoration of marine and coastal ecosystems. So as I said, it is implemented in two main regions, Southeast Asia and the Atlantic, as I'm saying, two main, because uh, as I'm going to explain later, we are also having connections and in exchanges with other actors also in the, in the Pacific or even in the Indian Ocean uh, now. The duration of the project is uh, uh, 48 months. So we had to spend one year to extend one year because the, the pandemic. So the project will end uh, in December 2023. Uh, and it's a project which is um, promoted uh, or launched, was launched by the foreign policy instrument. So this is quite unusual for environmental uh, projects they, um, because normally they come from DEFCOV or from DG environment. In this case is a, 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 a project that, which is targeting the connection between the ground action on uh, conservation of marine ecosystems and the political dimension of this ocean governance. So that explains uh, why so different actions uh, that I'm going to present later. So we have uh, obviously our program manager is from uh, Foreign Policy Instrument, Mrs. Elena Laxo, and we have a steering committee at the European Commission that has this advisory function with the, in which uh, a number of uh, people from different directorates at the European Commission is also participating because as you will see, the project has different um, 
technical aspects that also require this um, follow up and this advisory role from the steering committee. So the, here you have also the, the team. This is the basic team, uh, but there are other people, other experts also uh, in, uh, contributing at different levels of the project. I will not mention all the people. And let me go back a few years before uh, the ocean governance begins and why we go to 2016 in this case. So I, I want to go back because this uh, ocean governance is a project that gives continuity to a previous EU project, project also for, from the foreign policy instrument that was called a Transatlantic MPA Network Project. And this Transatlantic MPA Network Project have had two, two periods of implementation. The first one was during 2016 and 2017, and there was an additional extension time of one, one year and, and a half. Sorry, I, it must be 2019 in the second uh, year. And uh, then there was launched the ocean governance that, as I say, it gives continuity. So this first project was very interesting because uh, it consists on uh, implementing a new concept of, of Atlanticism from Europe. Normally, for those that know uh, European institutions, there have been a lot of exchanges between Europe and many different countries, normally uh, bilateral between the uh, European Union and the US, uh, Mexico, Brazil, many uh, African countries. But in this, in this case, uh, the, the European Parliament requests the European Commission to work in a more integrative manner uh, across the Atlantic and in a way that we could create cooperation with many different countries at the same time. So and, and in this case, the focus for this cooperation was on marine protected areas. It was a, like a pilot initiative. And it also was designed to contribute to the European Union commitments to tackle global biodiversity loss, to support all the climate change adaptation, and also to respond to the EU uh, internal policies uh, um, on environment. And, um, the project was uh, specifically designed to promote cooperation between managers of marine protected areas in countries and territories around the ocean, uh, um, at, um, the Atlantic Ocean. I, I don't want to talk about the Atlantic Ocean because there is only one ocean, and I think it's important to keep this in mind. Let's say the Atlantic Basin. And it was designed to stimulate exchange and sharing of best practice to improve the effective management of marine protected areas in coastal and, and offshore areas of the Atlantic. I'm sure that a number of you that are attending the, the webinar today are directly connected to the management of marine protected areas. So this project certainly uh, give value to the work of um, management and put this management in a scale of relevance for exchanges across the Atlantic. During this first project, we developed a scoping study. So it was uh, just a first identification on what exists in the, in the Atlantic rega regarding marine protected areas. So just to give you a few uh, quick numbers, we identified more than 14 coastal marine protected areas, 14 uh, and 500. So this is amazing. Never before were identified, and obviously in just a short, such a short time, we could not go in deep in the identifying characteristics and levels of management, but was, this allowed us to do a first map. And now we are working in the ocean governance to update this scoping study, this map, and we are gathering information on many other different uh, um, topics and geographic areas. So this is something uh, that is going to be a final document at the end of the ocean governance with this update on all those different topics you can see now in the in the screen and we are also mapping uh, downscale from the 116 that we had 16 million we had in the past in the first edition to 18 million so during this transatlantic time we developed three uh, twinning projects so those twinning um, were not between twins within just two marine protected areas were more partnership projects between several marine protected areas and between several networks of marine protected areas, net networks of managers. I'm not talking here when I'm referring to networks in my presentation today. Uh, let me just clarify, I'm referring to the networks of marine protected areas managers. So we talk about human networks. Obviously we could have a specific focus on ecological networks. This will be another topic, obviously very important, but it's not what we will be talking today. So these three twinning projects 
uh, were um, addressing different levels of cooperation on different topics. So we have uh, first one was uh, the uh, common strategy between networks of managers. Uh, second one was on uh, addressing the challenge that the managers of MPA have uh, regarding the coastal resilience and the rapid changes happening in those areas. And the third one was about uh, marine mammal protection and how the MPA managers are dealing with the incorporation of specific actions in their management plans to really uh, protect those, those group of species. So these were the three topics. And during the, um, during the two years and uh, two years and the additional one year and a half, we had several exchanges between the key actors that you see here in the map. Then now we are increasing the number of, of um, not actors, number of partners involved in these twinnings. But probably the most relevant joint result of those uh, twinnings and those partnerships was the fact that we put the management in a higher level than before regarding the relevance of management of MPAs in the political agenda. So from the three twinnings, we were very involved in different international events. Here you have just a few uh, pictures on our activity during IMPACT 4, the International Marine Protected Areas Congress uh, that happened in, um, in La Serena in Chile. Uh, and we had a lot of activities showing the importance of giving strong support to the management level and giving support the man to the managers to really have right platforms for exchanging about their different um, management aspects that they are involved with. So this really uh, stressed the value of networking. And then the, the European Commission was quite happy with the results of those exchanges with the three twinnings, and they decided to give continuity uh, to, the, to this experience uh, in the Atlantic. So by giving continuity, there was launched a new project. And here is when it begins, the Ocean Governance Project that start in uh, January 2020. And the project had four components. And as you will see, one of the components is specifically the continuity of this previous transatlantic MPA network project. But we have other three components that are really relevant in the current project. And it really will contribute to really increase this, this dimension of networking and cooperation for marine conservation. So the four components, the first one, is um, the, it's about re restoration. It's a, the name is increased knowledge and practice of protecting and restoring marine and coastal ecosystems in three selected areas of MPAs in the Southeast Asia region. The second one is the continuity of the transatlantic. The third one is very interesting because it's a component that allows us to connect key actors, mainly our partners in the Atlantic with uh, actors in the Southeast Asia and promote exchanges between the two basins. So this is going uh, beyond the borders of the regional dimension. And the full component is a component that aims to create um, transboundary cooperation between uh, protected areas and between actors related uh, to the marine protected areas in Southeast Asia across the border. So this is uh, like say a component that we call the transboundary cooperation component. And it's also very relevant. And, and as you can see, the challenge here is uh, using all these components, uh, build a project that really strengthens the value of the management, the value of networking for improving management, and the connection of those networking and this management with the regional and international policies for marine protected areas. So I'm going to describe uh, with a little bit more detail each of, the, of those components. So the first one, which is the one uh, addressing restoration in Southeast Asia, obviously talking about Southeast Asia means talking about a huge ocean area. We cannot uh, work on everywhere. So we select um, a specific uh, region, which is the Sulu Sulawesi seascape within the Coral Triangle area. So during the, 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 initial, the beginning of the project until now, we, we were identifying the three restoration sites and we elaborate with the main stakeholders in each restoration site, the, the restoration plans. And now we are at the beginning of implementing. Unfortunately, as you can imagine, the pandemic didn't help on that. So we had uh, some delays. And um, why this Sulu Sulawesi uh, seascape? Well, this Sulu Sulawesi marine ecoregion is certainly an area that um, 
is very, very relevant for biodiversity and is very relevant for uh, addressing the establishment of marine protected areas and um, doing a good management for those marine protected areas. So the first step was to identify uh, five potential sites you have here in the map. Uh, those sites are in three different countries, Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. And from these um, five initial sites, we did a very detailed analysis of um, uh, potentialities for uh, having the best results when we will be implementing the, the restoration. And this, is not, this, um, this analysis is not only addressing ecological aspects, but also social aspects. Why? Because uh, if you have been involved in restoration projects, you know that this is not enough that you go when during a certain time to a place and restore the ecosystem. Uh, the restoration requires a strong uh, commitment and a lot of follow-up and a lot of monitoring uh, activity. So you cannot do this during the time only of a project. If you want to have results, you need to be sure that after the project, this monitoring and this su support for the restoration work will continue. So that means that you need to work closely with the local uh, um, communities. And this is was also something very relevant to have the communities motivated to be involved in this uh, restoration process. So the first site we uh, decide uh, to act in Malaysia is to Mustafa Park in the, in the Sabah region. And then we identify different sites in which we will be uh, restoring uh, corals that have been damaged. So this, um, this is the, the kind of ecosystem is different in each of the sites. Um, in the, the case, for instance, of Malaysia and Indonesia is uh, about coral reefs, while in the Philippines is about mangroves. The second site is Indonesia and is in there one uh, island marine protected area. And again, we work uh, with the local authority, uh, with the local community, and the same as in, in Malaysia and with the local authorities and the, the parks authority of those areas, plus the, the key uh, actors at, at the community level. So we have been drafting the restoration plans and now we are at the beginning of uh, the war. So for instance, in the case of the Malaysia, the kickoff for the restoration will happen in just two weeks, the 19th of, of May, just before the Asia Parks uh, Congress that we will take place also in Saba, not, not so far from the restoration site. So this is the case for the one. And then the third one is in the Philippines. And then the Philippines, uh, the selected site is in, in Balabac and the south of Balabac. And uh, we have, in fact, two sites for mangrove restoration, one with the uh, local community community in Poblacion, and the other one with uh, an, an, an indigenous community community in the south of Balabac. So again, here it's very important this involvement of the uh, local population on on all the the restoration. So to be uh, honest, this is more relevant. We, we aim the project obviously to be successful in terms of the ecosystem, but the most relevant uh, aspect is to create a process with the community, with the uh, authorities, with the key actors that may motivate other sites in those countries to, improve, to implement restoration projects. So it's more about the overall process for restoration with the involvement of uh, local stakeholders where we put the effort because uh, we really think that this needs to be amplified and we cannot amplify just by a single project, but we can just create this pilot that can motivate other actors in the in the countries to to do the same. So this is this is slide is a resume on the three restoration sites in each country and also the kind of uh, restoration that will be done in mangrove in the Philippines and a coral reef uh, using mainly two techniques, the rock pile and the spider frame as the basis for for doing this restoration in the coral reefs. I will not enter into the details because this will take a long time. And now. Uh, let's move to the, to the second uh, component. As I say, this component gives continuity to the previous transatlantic MPA network. And um, it's, it's also very relevant to uh, include new uh, uh, topics, such for instance, the restoration of coral reefs, which is very closely related with the, the, the resilience work or the transboundary cooperation, because in fact, during the transatlantic 
uh, first uh, project, we identified several nice examples of transboundary co cooperation between MPAs of different countries in the Atlantic. So this also serves as an element for exchanges. And uh, this, then we have this third component that aims to promote exchanges uh, between the Atlantic and so this is yeah, in which we can share all those experiences. So this is uh, related with uh, component one, but also it's related with component three. Uh, we continue exactly with the three twinning projects or partnership projects we initiate in the past, but we are enlarging the number of partners and we are enlarging the topics and, the, and, the, and going deeper in the work we are doing. So we have this, the, the three twinning projects. And now I'm gonna just show you that uh, some particularities of each of them. So this is the previous map, the one we had in the past, and now we, our map is having much many more uh, partners in many different countries. And uh, you can see also here as, as well, the three restoration sites in Southeast Asia. So these are more, this is a resume of the areas of grown action. I'm saying grown action because as initially mentioned, the project is not only about grown action, it's also about connecting this grown action with a regional and international uh, policies. So the first I'm gonna share um, in detail is about the uh, uh, resilience. So I'm very sorry because my, my two colleagues that coordinate these two twinnings on resilience and on marine mammals, they are not available. They are just having their uh, annual workshops with their partners. And I'm currently, for instance, attending the one on resilience in Senegal, but they are now just with the, with the partners uh, working. So they cannot um, be presenting their, their twinnings as they initially uh, were the, their desire. So, but Jean-Jacques Goussard is the coordinator for this twinning. And this twinning um, initially have 11 historical MPA partners. Historical means that they were already involved in the transatlantic time uh, from uh, countries such as Brazil, Gabon, Mexico, Portugal, Senegal, and, uh, and the US. And they were, uh, they start by sharing experiences, good practices, tools, approaches, and many different issues related to the strategies that they implement, that are implemented by marine protected areas managers to cope with these rapid changes that are uh, suffering today. And also they exchange about the different approaches developed by MBAs to contribute to resilience, uh, not only resilience in the marine protected areas, but resilience in coastal zones in general, because often what we observe is that MBAs serve as laboratories for the different tests on how to address the challenges on, on resilience in coastal areas in general. So the, this allowed to provide um, MPA managers with tools. Uh, so I'm gonna mention more in detail this uh, resilient, uh, uh, resilient self-assessment tool. And this is a tool that helps the ma managers to assess and to monitor MPA's uh, resilience-oriented management capacity. One of the things we realized from the beginning of this training is that there were very few MPAs that really had worked in deep on this resilience. And in, by other hand, this is a challenge for almost all MPAs. So um, helping the managers to address this topic was the main objective of the twinning. So the, another aspect relevant was to take into account key factors that are generally not considered in management effectiveness frameworks. So for instance, most of those, those um, factors are related to uh, how to be resilient, how to address the, the challenges uh, uh, of those changes. And finally, to contribute to the improvement of marine protected areas management plans by providing guidance to reinforce this resilience capacity. So uh, the colleagues involved in this training, they have uh, designed and created a toolkit for, um, for managers in which uh, they have different, different kinds of elements. So they share good practices, they have the, the resilience frequent aspect questions. They have the uh, marine protected areas resilience guidelines and fact sheets, and they have the resilience self-assessment uh, tool. So all these, uh, for instance, the tool, you can see just uh, here uh, a little diagram. Uh, the tool uh, addresses many different uh, thematic issues, but only, um, mainly by, uh, under five uh, criteria, anticipation, awareness, and preparation 
preparation towards uh, uh, the, cha the changes, territorial integration of marine protected areas, social and cultural integration of marine protected areas, the political support, the inst institutional resilience, and also the knowledge manage management and, and know-how. So uh, at the end, when each manager uh, is looking in detail to the different elements included in this self-assessment tool, at the end, there is a graphic that similar to the one you can see here that summarizes what are the strengths, but also the weaknesses of the MPA regarding their capacity to, to be resilient. So this is uh, something that uh, helps a lot the managers to identify what should be the most urgent things to address in order to be sure that the MPA uh, can have a better, better resilience. So um, then there is uh, the website. So you have here the, the address of this uh, website. You can mm, mm, consult uh, whenever you want. And you will find there all those elements, you, uh, the resilience news, the updated scientific resources, a lot of papers about resilience, resilience good practice, this, uh, these facts, and also the online version for this resilience self-assessment tool and the resilience guidelines. So the self-assessment tool is also available on Excel format because sometimes the managers want to work uh, in places that there is not a good uh, internet connection. So there's also the possibility to do uh, with, all, uh, with all this connection. So what is, is relevant uh, during, uh, about these five elements for the criteria is that um, they, they are in certain manner, all of them exist, but they are now integrated and this provides uh, an innovative view on that. So for instance, on anticipation, on, on, uh, uh, anticipation is crucial for resilience. So it's not about monitoring what's happening, but also uh, observing what may happen in the future. And, and this management responsiveness is, not, uh, is something that is not always present in the management uh, plans. And also this dimension I mentioned about the integration of marine protected area into land use uh, organization. What we realize that is uh, too often happens that the managers are not, uh, the management plans and the, the, the MPA itself is not always well identified by the larger uh, planning uh, for, the, for the area. So all these connections at the end are crucial for being resilient to face the, 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 the different actions that the, that the MPA must address. So this is part of uh, really identifying in, a, uh, in an anticipated manner, going to improve this integration of the MPA in the overall territorial planning. And that's exactly the same with the, with the key stakeholders. So, uh, resilience is not about only ecosystem, it's about people as well, and how you integrate those people in, uh, in the work of the MPA and how they benefit from the work of the MPA for having large uh, areas, uh, coastal areas, more resilient. And obviously as well, all this political uh, dimension, the need of the political uh, uh, support as well. Uh, the manager alone cannot do all the work that is required for being resilient. So how to develop this uh, political and institutional resilience is also part of the things addressed with the tool and uh, as well uh, of the issue of knowledge ma management and how to take advantage of this knowledge management to apply in a, a, a higher levels and in another MPAs and as well, including all the technical uh, restoration capacities because not only, but uh, uh, resilience also include a strong component on restoration very often. So we have uh, the RSAT lessons learned because uh, so far we have implemented this, um, this uh, uh, RSAT in 31 marine protected areas in 12 different countries. So this pro is providing us also a good feedback on the weaknesses of the tool on how we can, we can improve the tool, but also to see how we can develop training uh, activities for the managers to use this, this RSAT in a more friendly manner. So uh, actually it, it, it can be used also in a faster manner with just one or two hours. And this uh, allows the managers to have a first uh, perception of, on what they can, they can do. So this is, uh, for instance, uh, something we have been doing here in Senegal with a very good results with different, with different managers. 
And uh, just finally, uh, let me mention that the training has also been very active on this political connection of the Brown uh, activity. And this connection means that, for instance, uh, the award that was done to have a specific resolution on, 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 on coastal resilience during the last IUC and World Conservation Project. So just uh, to finalize with this part, this is a picture of yesterday here in, in, in Senegal with a group of managers and a group of partners of the twinning just discussing on the, the use of this uh, uh, ARS uh, tool and what, what they learned from this and how they really are taking advantage for their management work. And now let me share a little bit about the marine mammals. This um, twinning is uh, coordinated by my colleague Francis Stock, and it's uh, about uh, building technical capacities for marine managers uh, by sharing, again, knowledge, expertise, and, and good practice, but also to provide them with another, another tool. As you can see, the tools are key elements in the um, um, in the approach of the twinnings in, a, to, in order to provide better tools to the managers and that can last after the project. So also um, the idea is to create this network of peers that uh, especially managers that are addressing the same um, equivalent challenges, but targeting the same species, because when we talk about marine mammals, we talk mainly about migratory species that are the same individuals are in many different MPAs along the year, but doing different uh, uh, actions in different moments of, of the, their life uh, cycle. So um, then uh, the current training partners for the marine mammals, you have here um, the Agua Santuary, the Irwas Marine Natural Park in France, Stilbagan, Yarari. Uh, we have also national entities, such as the Ministry of Agriculture and Environment of Cap Vert, uh, the Government of Bermudas, the Fisheries and Oceans of Canada. Another, uh, let's say, more technical uh, the, or political actors, such as the Uni University of Iceland, Karimam uh, Stranding Initiative, SPORAC, linked to the Cartagena Convention in the Caribbean, or the International Whaling Commission. So the, the, the toolkit, uh, you, can, you, can have, um, you can have a look at this, uh, at this um, uh, website. And in this, in this toolkit, um, you, you will find different um, informations that are very relevant. For instance, different fact sheets um, on different topics. And also there are five core themes here on management framework, on uh, uh, activities and suites, research and monitoring, outreach, engagement, and obviously management uh, effectiveness. And this is continually evolving with advances in conservation actor, actions. So the self-assessment tool, I think it's better if just stop for a moment my presentation uh, and I share with you a video that I think you will enjoy very much. And I hope you are, I hope you will. I'm gonna share again the video because this will allow me to reduce my speech. You will understand better Marine mammals play a crucial role in marine ecosystem function and climate change resilience. Marine protected areas, MPA, are a common tool adopted to protect marine mammals. In order to empower practitioners, managers, and policymakers to effectively conserve marine mammals, the Ocean Governance Marine Mammal Twinning created a toolkit to guide the conservation of marine mammals through MPAs. Marine Mammals Management Toolkit contains three key components. Fact sheets, self-assessment tool, and good practices. There are 23 available fact sheets within the toolkit that provide concise information, examples to common barriers, and guidance on solutions while directing to helpful resources. The self-assessment tool enables MPA managers to assess the extent to which marine mammals are included in their management plans. Accessible as an interactive tool, it facilitates the monitoring and evaluation of MPAs over time. The good practices have been designed to present key examples of good practices implemented throughout MPAs and the marine environment. Visit www.marine-mammals.info for more information. Share resources, suggestions, and good practices, 
at quotient-governance at biodivcouncil.fr. Okay, I stop the sharing of the video and continue with my presentation. Moment. Mm -hmm. no, it's not okay. One second, please. Yeah. So this slide is just part of what you saw in the in the videos, COVID. And I suggest you that you you check because I think it's very it's very interesting. And and now we are also we begin by developing this tool just for humpback whales, and now we are adapting to many other species, and even not also, uh, not only marine mammals. We are also working now to adapt the tool for marine turtles because marine turtles is. Uh, one of the topics that we incorporate in the ocean governance but th that we didn't work in the past. And I think it's also very, very important to stress that the tools are available in French, Spanish, and English, exactly the same as the resilience tools. So you can uh, use it in, in, uh, in the three different languages. So this is how it looks some of, of, the, of the results of the, um, of the different scores. And the, the next steps is, are mainly about the uh, training of trainers and helping the managers to learn how to use the tool and uh, promoting that is applied in, in, uh, in many different uh, MPAs. We are also designing a mentoring program and also create this community of practitioners. So if you want to be involved, just uh, use the tool and you can also contact us and you can review the toolkit and especially the fact sheets and uh, provide also good practices from your, your experience or case studies. So this is the, the address. And uh, as I said, my colleagues of the marine mammals uh, twinning uh, were meeting, um, are also meeting this week. The picture I think is from yesterday and they, are, they were just having the meeting in, in Cambridge. So uh, let me now talk about the networks of um, managers twinning. This twinning uh, be it initially began with just few networks, uh, re four regional ones in the Caribbean, in the Mediterranean, in North America, in, and in West Africa, plus two national agencies working also with MPAs, the French Biodiversity Agency and Fundación Biodiversidad. But now the twinning has been uh, enlarged a lot with many other regional partners, such as OSPOR and HELCOM conventions, Red Parkes, the Marine and Coastal Group, Red Parkes in Latin America, the Patagonian Forum, or Red Golfo in the Gulf of Mexico, and recently also the CMAR Corridor, which is not in the Atlantic, but in the Pacific, because they found that exchanging with this uh, twinning, it really, uh, it will be really useful. And it's also useful for us to have exchanges with the Pacific. This is uh, at regional level, but at national level, we have also more partners. For instance, the, the NOAA in the US, that were previously involved as NAMPAM, but now are there also as NOAA, the CONAM in Mexico, Parks of Colombia, the Directorate of Biodiversity of Dominican Republic, the Department of Rocha in Uruguay, Oceano Sanos in Uruguay, National Parks and the Community MPAs in Senegal. And the networks uh, um, twinning have four strategic actions about sharing information, knowledge, and tools, building the network capacity, uh, policy support, and financing. So for instance, on financing, we develop a strategy for sustainable financing. In policy support, we participate in international events and processes. And for the first two components, we are now doing uh, developing a desk study about the network's effectiveness. What are the key elements to really identify how a network may be effective? These are just a few examples about the sharing information, knowledge, and tools, about a few webinars we we organize uh, some of them are in collaboration with the other two twinnings about also the promotion of the tools on resilience and uh, marine uh, mammals and also specific focus on um, marine turtles. We are also providing uh, support to the partners activities at regional level, for instance, here two examples for a Patagonian forum or for, or for the Mediterranean forum on marine protected areas. And at the political level, at this policy support level, we have been very active at many different international events. So those are just few uh, uh, images of the first ocean conference. But now, now we are preparing 
or participation at the new ocean conference in Lisbon. And let me just uh, mention a specific um, uh, thing we developed recently, which is a, an alliance with restore, uh, with um, conservation trust funds. Uh, with restoration, conservation trust fund, sorry, I'm still with the <laughs> restoration topic, and with the ma marine protected areas uh, managers networks. Because we think that by cooperating with these two kind of institutions, we can really have better impact, and especially better impact uh, to motivate the donors to provide funds for networking and funds for management. So we launched this, uh, this uh, alliance during the last uh, UCN World Conservation Congress in Marseille, and now we are designing our own planning of joint activities to, to really develop this cooperation. And this, now I, um, I'm gonna talk briefly about this component three, the exchanges between the, the two regions, between the Southeast Asia and the Atlantic. And the idea is to take advantage of the knowledge we already uh, gathered during the previous transatlantic project and also what we are identifying now for uh, in, in Southeast Asia, link it to the restoration and the transboundary cooperation and create exchanges. So it has been a, a, a little bit difficult so far because the COVID, but we had the first example uh, of exchange virtual. And this first virtual learning exchange allow us to uh, have a set of uh, sessions in which we share all the different thematics we are working in both sides, in the Atlantic and in the Southeast Asia. And it was co-organized with the Coral Triangle Initiative, which is a key partner for us in Southeast Asia. And from this first experience, now we are designing an, in a second um, exchange, but hopefully will not be virtual, but uh, physical in Southeast Asia, and, uh, or, and, and probably an hybrid event in which we can have both kind of participants, uh, uh, presential participants there, but also online. And this allowed to, to really identify a lot of topics that are relevant, not only for the two regions, but are relevant worldwide for ocean conservation. Some are technical, such restoration issues on the ground, but others are more strategic. And for instance, how the networks can be really instrumental to provide this co uh, the connection with the international and regional policies and the ground action level for management. So we were discussing about all those topics. And just to finalize, because I'm at the end of my time, uh, let me talk uh, briefly about this four component, which is related to transboundary cooperation. And finally, after doing an analysis and evaluation of, of opportunities, we identified that the most relevant themes we can work now will be to support the international convention, in this case, the CBD, and, and, the, and the targets for marine protected areas, and to support the Migratory Species Convention, uh, which has a, a specific resolution for so this is here, uh, regarding marine mammals. So, we decide to address these two main conventions and provide support uh, regionally um, by working with two regional organizations that are already existing and with developing strong programs for, for marine protection, which are the Coral Triangle Initiative and the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity. And here um, we want to just uh, 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 stress the values for this transboundary cooperation that are really relevant for the habitats and for the migratory species and in the region and, and beyond the region, but also generate this um, potential sociocultural and economic benefits to people. And that is, is important, uh, not only to look at the biodiversity, but this connection with people. Uh, we applied um, two of the three different categories of transboundary areas identified by AUCN, the classical transboundary protected area between two adjacent uh, MPAs um, is the one that we will not work so far. Now uh, we will work uh, especially on the conservation landscape of seascape. That's why we work uh, at the at the Sulu Sulawesi seascape, and also with the migratory uh, um, conservation um, approach. Those will be the, the main elements for the transboundary cooperation, and um, this uh, will consist mainly on organizing uh, two different workshops or trainings in which uh, key stakeholders and key actors in the region, and also obviously the responsible governments will be invited to really address the 
implementation of those of those targets for marine conservation, especially those, as I said, of the Migratory Species uh, Convention and the CBD. It's important to stress that the, the proposals are aligned with, with the existing regional activities that enables also cooperation, which is, for instance, the ASEAN heritage parts of the ASEAN Center, or also the different, um, the, the, the goal three of the Coral Triangle Initiative and establishing um, MPAs uh, that are effectively managed. So this is uh, important for us to strengthen these re regional institutions and create connections beyond the, beyond the institutions. We identified a different stakeholders in Southeast Asia that are going to be uh, invited to those events and participate to those uh, regional debates. So uh, just two weeks ago, we were uh, in, uh, in, in Philippines and in Malaysia. We had a first meeting with the ASEAN Center of Biodiversity, a first meeting physically. And we are now planning this joint event um, for linked to the COP15 of the CBD, but also the implementation of the targets, for instance, the 30 by 30 or the 10 percent of no take zones and uh, on the uh, other effective area basic conservation measures. So those will be the main elements that we want to uh, use to provide support to the region and to promote cooperation between different countries. So uh, I stop here. I could talk for hours because, as you can see, there are many different dimensions of the project, uh, all of them very, very interesting. And I give here, if you want to contact us, you have uh, two email addresses, my, the, mine and as well as the, my colleague that is in charge of the uh, communications, which is uh, Barbara Casado. And I stop and that's now your time. <laughs> for you, thank you so much. That was very <laughs> informative. I, I learned a ton. Um, well, so thank you for that presentation. And I wanted to invite anyone who had questions to send them in through the question and answer, answer panel or through the chat. And if you had comments or um, helpful suggestions, all, all that is good too. Um, we do have a couple of questions already. Um, one Barbara has uh, answered in the chat, but I'll go ahead and ask Pori so everyone can hear it. Um, is it possible to have the tools translated into other languages, Italian, for example? Uh, if someone provides the fonts, absolutely, yes. It's a question of resources. So uh, why we just select this uh, uh, French, English, and Spanish is because with this, almost all the managers can work in the, in the Atlantic. But we are also working uh, with Portuguese for the Atlantic. So we are in the process also to adapt to translate the, to, to the Portuguese, but it, it may be translated. The, the point is that we don't have the resources actually in the project to translate to languages outside of the area in which we, we are implementing this component too. Okay. But we will, be, we will be available for providing the, all the uh, technical um, information and allow for a, a translation to other languages. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Another question, in relation to the tools developed through the project, have you been able to provide guidance on how these might relate to other tools currently being promoted for MPA managers? For example, other assessment tools such as MET, um, et cetera. It's clear that these new tools have useful purposes, but do we need a process to bring all the tools together and help MPA managers decide which ones they need? Yeah, this is a, a, a very important question. We, we don't want the tools to be um, isolated from all the different tools that exist. So in fact, and for instance, now I miss one of the presentations, which is about the MPA guide and how the, the resilience tool uh, can work um, in, in, a in a complementary manner. So the, um, my two colleagues could respond better because I'm not working at this uh, technical level, but they are uh, they know very well different management tools. They work in the past in the development of other management tools, and they are absolutely happy to connect with other with, with the others and to identify uh, what are the complementarities and uh, and also at the end to identify in the future gaps that may exist. Because the aim is that to give the managers as much as possibilities to to do the best uh, on their daily uh, job. Okay, thank you so much, Pori. Um, another question that came in. Good morning, great talk, thanks. 
I wanted to ask if you are thinking of incorporating the Caribbean into the project. Happy to discuss yes. potential collaborations. Yeah, the Caribbean is already there. There is CAMPAM, uh, the network of the Marine Protected Areas Managers in the Caribbean from the beginning and one of the oldest networks in the world. So uh, it, now it, it, they are represented by the SPO uh, protocol and, and by the UNEPSEP. They are uh, involved directly in the network's twinning uh, as a partner. And, and, but the other two twinnings have a Caribbean MPA. So Agua Centuary is in the, in the Caribbean. Dominican Republic is also participating in some exchanges of the, of the network's twinning, but also the, the marine mammals twinning. And uh, the, in fact, the uh, Dominican Republic um, host one of the, of the network training workshops in, in the past. We have also Mexico that also have MPAs in the Caribbean that are directly involved. Uh, now we have, for instance, one of them here in, uh, participating in, in Senegal from, from, from Veracruz, but also other MPAs in, in, uh, in the Caribbean side of Mexico and Yucatan are also related um, closely collaborating with the resilience training. Uh, Cozumel was in the past, but also uh, Alacranes and uh, Puerto Morelos. Uh, Colombia is also involved, and I think I'm forgetting some, some of them, but, but yes, uh, the Caribbean is, is really, really relevant. And also the Red Golfo, uh, it is Gulf of Mexico, when it's, more or less, it's not exactly Caribbean, but, but in, in, includes also part of this world. So mm, yes, the Caribbean is relevant, but if there are other actors that are interested, so we will be glad to exchange. We, we cannot expand infinitely, but we can have uh, exchanges with many people, even if they are not participating on everything we organize. Okay, thank you so much, Puri. Um, I have a couple of questions. I was curious if either of the tools um, captures the data from, from various users in a, in a central location so that you can sort of do a roll up of the data and compare um, what level of resilience sort of work is going on or marine mammal protection work is going on in different areas. Um, yeah, that's one of the things that for me, they are relevant, very interesting both tools because by just looking at the final diagram you, you reach after responding all the questions, you can have the, like different profiles of MPAs with, dif with equivalent challenges. So it's very interesting because this allows you to compare where are the strengths and the weaknesses of different MPAs. So, and this uh, also for us is good to have many different kinds of MPAs uh, filling the, the questionnaire and having the diagrams because also helps us to identify if we should modify something to be more performant or maybe uh, add some element that was not there or be more in detail. So this, just comparing, it's, uh, it's a good point to also figure all the diversity of situations that MPAs are facing when we talk about marine mammals protection or when we talk about uh, resilience. Okay, thank you. And I know it's fairly early in the project and, and everything was delayed by COVID, but I was wondering if there are any instances that you can talk about where sort of the transatlantic partnerships or the regional partnerships affected how people were doing their work. Uh, well, uh, if you heard directly at the partners, um, they want all of them want to be continue want to continue with the exchanges. So they recognize that the the being involved in those partnerships, they help them to improve their capacity. And uh, that's also part of the role of the networks to not just uh, limit the exchanges to few MPAs that are, for instance, in the twinning or net, uh, marine mammals or resilience, but also uh, amplify and distribute those, those tools at their, uh, at their networks level. So to reach many more uh, MPA managers. So we had, for instance, the, during the um, Mediterranean Forum on NPAs, we had the opportunity to organize two trainings on uh, the use of the two tools. And it was the responses from the managers that were participating were very, very positive. And they are, many of them now, they are just trying to incorporate and from the uh, under management plans, elements that just identified during, 
during the, 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 the use of the tools. So I, I just think in yesterday, uh, because this is more recent and I heard di directly during the discussions with uh, different MPA managers here in Senegal that all of them apply the resilience tool. They told us that they help, this helped a lot, the fact of being connected with other managers and the fact to apply the tool to identify things that they can do easily that they didn't just didn't realize. So I think that, yes, the transatlantic exchanges definitely help managers. The only point to be uh, humble is that uh, there is just a, a limited number. If you compare with the 14,500 MPAs I initially said that were identified in the scoping study, obviously our contribution is little. That was why, that's why it's so important, the networking dimension, the work of the networks to really scale, scale in this and put to the available uh, to many other managers at regional level. For instance, now we are preparing with the networks training, uh, a specific training on a, a MPA management effectiveness at, at the MPA level. And this is going to be, uh, this edition is only in Spanish and it's going to be implemented by the Patagonian Forum, one of our partners that already have this program built in the past. And uh, now we are replicating for many, for 25, 25 uh, managers, uh, that they speak Spanish. We will do other trainings in French and in English. So certainly the managers, the information we receive from them is that this is, the exchanges are really useful. And that's what we want to guarantee that after the project, we can mobilize more resources for networking and allowing many more managers in the Atlantic. It's so this easy, but also managers in the Indian Ocean, we are now in contact through the new network, we are PAN, or managers in the Pacific, to take advantage of all this knowledge because the, the challenges are not so different. There are obviously specificities at each MPA, but the, the challenges are quite common. Okay, thank you so much, Pori. Um, there was a question that came in. Are the tools and materials from the project going to be incorporated into the forthcoming UNEP MPA toolbox? Uh, I don't know where, I know my colleagues are in contact with UNEP and um, this is something uh, I cannot respond yes, not, but we will be glad if they are incorporated. But uh, I cannot respond. I know that they are in exchange and probably probably uh, they may be incorporated because it makes sense, but I cannot respond yes or not right now because I don't have the last information. But you okay. can contact us by email and we, uh, we can respond. Okay. All right. Thank you, Pori. Um, and we don't have any other questions. Um, this was a very, uh, I mean, it was, it was, there's so much going on. So we appreciate the thoroughness of how well you oriented us to the various activities. Um, it sounds like wonderful work and we look forward to seeing its progress over the years. So thank you very much, Pori. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And thank you to everyone who's able to attend. We appreciate your time and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure and you, you have seen my, my email address and uh, all the websites for the tools. So please feel free. We will be more than happy to have a lot of people uh, reaching us, asking questions and taking advantage of our work. That okay. is for, uh, that is your service. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye everyone.